Hey guys, Culture here. Today we're going to be talking about the DMZ. More specifically, we'll look at why the DMZ was created and whether the DMZ can become a symbol for peace. I doubt it. With the huge lines, angry tellers, and mind-numbing interior decorating, I'd say the DMV is one of the least peaceful places on Earth. The DMZ, not the DMV. You know, the border between North and South Korea. Oh, well, excuse me! The DMZ makes way more sense as a symbol for peace. That place where people are, are constantly threatening to launch missiles at each other. Yeah, let's all roll up there and hug each other and sing songs. I see skies blue and clouds of white. Okay, you made your point. Though people think of the DMZ as this incredibly dangerous place, it kind of is and kind of isn't. After all, it's in the name. DMZ stands for Demilitarized Zone. In this 250 km long, 4 km wide stretch of land, no military activities can be carried out. Of course, that's what's supposed to happen, but the reason the DMZ is so tense is because it's constantly under threat of attack. Within the DMZ is the Joint Security Area, JSA, where North Korean and South Korean officials can meet to discuss sensitive matters. When you see the soldiers facing each other across this space with their stoic, impassive expressions, the tension is palpable. Wow, those guys look like badasses! Unlike those poofy hat bucking and palace guards you always see laughing on YouTube. Tourists can actually visit select parts of the DMZ, but you definitely wouldn't be taking silly pictures with the guards there. In fact, to even get close, you need to sign a waiver which accepts responsibility for any harm or fatal injury you incur if an attack breaks out. And that's because, technically, North Korea and South Korea are still at war. Before World War II, Korea was under the control of Japan, who had fought numerous wars with China over the peninsula. Following their defeat in World War II, however, Korea was freed from Japanese control and left to be divided between the allied countries. The 38th parallel was chosen as the demarcation line, with the Soviet Union taking the north and the US taking the south. Of course, things got messy. Neither the Koreans nor the powers controlling them were very happy with this arrangement. The North, backed by China and the Soviet Union, embraced communism and led a series of attacks to take back the capitalist south, which was defended by the US. This started the Korean War, which resulted in the deaths of roughly 3 million people, half of which were civilians. To put that in perspective, a higher ratio of civilians died in the Korean War than in either World War II or the Vietnam War. Oh, come on, really? You're cutting to me now? For one of my jokes? No, nah, -uh, no way. The forces of the North and South reached a stalemate about a year into the war, with numerous attempts to push their respective front lines failing. On the 27th of July 1953, an armistice was signed by China, North Korea, and the UN, but not South Korea. Nevertheless, the armistice was carried out, which had numerous conditions, one of which was the creation of the Korean DMZ. Though the war was said to have ended on that day, an armistice is simply a truce. No peace treaty was ever signed. Combine the constant threat of military action with the memory of the blood shed on that land, and it's not hard to see why the DMZ is considered to be such a terrifying place. I mean, just those letters. DMZ sounds scary. Like a zombie movie or something. A, a zombie apocalypse in the DMZ. Oh my god. That's amazing! I've got a screenplay to write! Well, there aren't any bodies buried there. After the war, deals were made to return the bodies of soldiers back to their home countries to receive proper burials. What you will find are barbed wire fences, soldiers standing guard, and minefields. While the DMZ is technically demilitarized, that hasn't stopped North and South Korea from using the space as a way to flaunt their strengths. Along their respective front lines, each country has set up a number of displays intended to prove their superiority. The most obvious of these are loudspeakers that blare propaganda. The North Korean side blast out anti-capitalist propaganda and declare the glory of their own country, while the South Koreans are a little more creative with both anti-communist propaganda but also K-pop to show the North just how much better their culture is. Oh yeah! Jamming out to BTS at the DMZ! <laughs> Sick. It doesn't stop there, though. In the 1980s, South Korea built a 98-meter-tall flagpole on their side of the DMZ. So, of course, North Korea responded with a 160-meter-tall flagpole. Real mature. One of the weirder tactics is the deployment of balloons over the border. North Korea would drop pamphlets preaching their ideology to the South, while South Korea dropped chocolate. If we're being precise here, South Korea dropped a special treat called choco pies to the North 
which were so valuable that people in the north would trade them for other goods and services. That may seem ridiculous, but once again, this was about showing the people of North Korea the kinds of delicacies that they can't have in their country. Similarly, North Korean defectors would smuggle USBs with films from the rest of the world back into their home country to show the media they're missing out on. Can you imagine a North Korean person seeing Avengers for the first time? Something tells me they wouldn't react too well to Captain America. While all this one-upmanship is funny to watch, it can be easy to forget how these antics can turn deadly far too quickly. Four tunnels leading from North Korea into South Korea have been discovered since the DMZ's creation, which the North claimed to be for coal mining purposes. The tunnels could have allowed a huge number of insurgents to enter South Korea at once. But that's not to say all the blame is on North Korea. In 1976, the US relayed that around 200 raids and incursions by South Korean forces had been made into North Korean territory to sabotage their facilities. Both sides also made attempts to assassinate one another's leaders. In the famous Blue House raid, a group of North Korean soldiers crossed the DMZ and attempted an assault on President Park Chung-hee's residence, called the Blue House, by wearing South Korean uniforms. They were uncovered and most of the group was killed, but not without first taking the lives of numerous enemy soldiers and civilians. In response, the South Koreans put together a black ops force composed of petty criminals called Unit 684 to assassinate Kim Il-sung. When their mission was cancelled in the interest of peace negotiations, the group revolted and killed their guards, trying to escape to the mainland. Wow, and I thought the craziest thing about Korea was mukbang. wonder if people would watch me eat heaps of food. That's the dream, baby. Oh, I've only just gotten started. By far the most absurd situation that happened in the DMZ is the axe murder incident. In 1976, a group of US and South Korean soldiers tried to trim a tree which was blocking the UN view of the JSA. Remember, that's the area in the DMZ where North and South Koreans are allowed to meet. The tree was located near the ominously named Bridge of No Return. The US officers in charge didn't have sidearms due to regulations, but they had a supply of axes and other tools. As they set to work, a group of North Korean soldiers led by Lieutenant Park Chul, nicknamed Lieutenant Bulldog, approached and insisted that they stop their work. When the Americans refused, Lieutenant Park ordered the North Korean soldiers to attack. The North Koreans bludgeoned one US officer to death, and when another tried to escape into a ditch, the North Koreans trailed him and chopped him into pieces. Worst neighbors ever. And to think, our neighbors complain about me screaming at my computer at 2 a.m. They don't know just how good they've got it. Bloodshed over a tree is outlandish enough, but what happened next is even crazier. North Korea claimed that they were attacked, which has since been disproven, and called for the US to be pulled out of South Korea. In response, the UN decided the best strategy was to return, and not only trim the tree, but this time chop the tree down. And even better, they would send out their axemen guarded by an absolute armada in a show of force. Two teams of soldiers guarded the engineers on the ground. Then, when a couple hundred North Korean troops showed up to dissuade them, the UN side responded by flying helicopters and air force jets over the horizon. At a nearby airbase in Japan, the runway was full of planes with soldiers ready to be deployed if a fight broke out. All up, there were over 800 men and at least 50 various aircraft ready to let loose, all so that they could just cut down that one tree. And then, just to really rub it in, the UN force left the tree stump remaining as a reminder to never mess with them again. Oh, that's bold. Like stealing someone's food from the fridge and then putting the empty Tupperware back instead of washing it. Yeah, please stop doing that, by the way. I suppose all of this is to say that the DMZ isn't just dangerous because each side has a bloody history with the other, but also because of the political ramifications of incidents that occur there. With Russia and America so heavily invested in the well-being of each side, they seem to treat the Korean Peninsula as a stage for demonstrating their military strength. And as you can imagine, the locals aren't too happy about that. One of the largest and most recent examples of this controversy is the rollout of the THAAD system. What a bro name for a weapon. Thad. I bet that Thad is ripped. I can just tell he's got like a 12 inch. You just know he's built AF. With six truck mounted launchers, I'd say built AF is absolutely the correct term for the Thad. Thad stands for Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, essentially an anti missile weapon that detects incoming missiles and intercepts them. Following threats from North Korea in 2013 of missile launches, South Korea started plans to have a THAAD system installed. Near where the THAAD system was being installed, the locals began protests against the system, saying it not only disturbed their peace, but was an unnecessary escalation of military action, which had now strayed far from the DMZ. You have to imagine, it would be daunting having a constant reminder that your country is at risk of being bombed in your own backyard. 
But it's also good to have that reminder. It keeps you in check. That's why I keep a life-size doll of Shane Dawson in my actual backyard. Like you say, Crash, reminders don't have to be a bad thing. Memorials are reminders of tragedies that can carry a lesson. They can remind us of the horrors of war, or act as a monument to why those people fought and died. In Hiroshima, the citizens have turned the place that was obliterated by the first atomic bomb into the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. Apart from a museum where you can learn more about the war, you can also see one of the buildings that was destroyed in the blast, now surrounded by beautiful gardens. The people of Hiroshima suffered a terrible, cruel disaster. But from this, they made a memorial so that we should never forget the horrors of nuclear weapons. In the same way, the DMZ could become a reminder of the tragedy of the Korean War. Barbed wire and guys with guns don't exactly scream peace to me. The DMZ isn't some scorched wasteland like you might picture. It's actually a beautiful sanctuary for wildlife. Because people can't freely occupy this strip of land, many endangered species which inhabit the Korean Peninsula have made their home in the wetlands and mountains of the DMZ. Species like the Asiatic black bear, the long-tailed gorel, and the red-crowned crane all live in the DMZ, and all of them are endangered with decreasing populations. Making the DMZ a protected reserve for wildlife could help transform its image. South Korea has also pushed for the DMZ to become a UNESCO World Heritage Site, labeling it as a symbol for peace. Furthermore, in 2018, the two countries took the biggest step yet in burying the hatchet when their leaders Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in met at the JSA in person. Maybe you shouldn't use the phrase burying the hatchet. You know, after the whole axe thing. Yeah. Good point. The DMZ has a bloody past, but despite media fear-mongering, it's still possible for the two countries to move past their history and hopefully, eventually, sign an actual peace accord and put the Korean War to an end for good. And it all starts with turning the DMZ from a place of despair into a place of hope. See you all soon.